Welcome back, everybody. This is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today, we've got a very special gun gripe for you. We've been thinking about some cool ideas for gripes, and we just came up with one that I think you guys are going to love. This one's called, What is the Perfect Rifle? And uh, you, you always see people get carried away in the argument of, oh, well, what's better, the, the SCAR or the FAL or the AK-47 or the AR-15? And like they, they, they draw these comparisons between two different guns and say, well, which one's better? We're going to try to dive into this adventure from more of a perspective about what features would we want in the perfect rifle, right? What type of action, so on and so forth. So we'll get into this and, and try to kind of go about it with some uh, interesting nuance. So uh, join us here for this discussion. And I really expect you guys to send me some comments down below and let me know about what you think the perfect features are in the perfect rifle for you. Also, make sure that you are following us over on Twitter at IraqVeteran8888 because we do a ton of Twitter polls and I actually just submitted a question here on Twitter and we asked a lot of our Twitter followers to tell us what their perfect rifle is. So we're going to share some of those with you here towards the end of the video. But before we get started, I would like to thank our friends at Sonoran Desert Institute for supporting our videos. If you're looking for a career in gunsmithing, they are definitely your go-to group of people for distance learning. They got some awesome instructors, great curriculum, great financial incentives, good, you know, good programs for you know, paying for school and everything like that. They've even got a drone program, reloading programs. So if you're wanting to get involved in the firearms industry, check them out, SDI, Sonoran Desert Institute. Tell them we sent you. Great group of people and a big thanks to them for supporting our efforts here um, in the 2A realm. So interesting question that we're posing here. And it's a loaded question, isn't it? Uh, the perfect rifle does not exist. Uh, goodbye. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean... You always hear people talk about features or they, again, they compare certain guns to, to, to each other. But what if you kind of said, hey, well, well what rifle kind of has most features that you would consider to be a, a good feature? I mean, are we talking a bolt action, a semi-auto? I mean, I think if we, if we just start to look at rifles, I think a semi-auto is, is certainly going to be towards more towards the perfect uh, rifle, at least for, for my purposes. And I think it's important to mention that, you know, there are a multitude of different purposes and there are a lot of purpose built rifles that are set up for specific things. I mean, obviously your standard hunting rifle or something like that, is going to be used in a very different way, uh, than, you know, maybe, a, an AR set up with a heavy barrel for long range shooting. So where do we find the Goldilocks zone? Where, where do we create the most perfect and usable tool that can be used for a wide variety of different purposes uh, no matter what that purpose may be and no matter what environment, situation, uh, of a reasonable caliber that can do a wide variety of different jobs. I mean, where do we seek out perfection? Where does that begin? I mean, I think semi-auto is the first place to look. This plasma rifle in the 40-watt range. <laughs> That's where it begins. I think magazine-fed and semi-auto are two very important cr criteria. Yeah, I don't think you can have the perfect rifle without it at least being magazine-fed. And, you know, we're not going back to, like, the, the scout rifle discussion or anything, but I, I think semi-auto is <clears throat> probably the the cream of the crop. You know, definitely. But caliber or cartridge. Mm. Ooh, man. Because, like... you got to be able to carry your ammo. Ooh. You got to be able to feed it. Let's assume that caliber is unimportant in terms of the cost. Let's say that cost is not a factor and doesn't matter what the ammo costs, but what rifle caliber uh, in, in, in a rifle could, could you, you know, consider to be perfect? Are we wanting to stick with a short action or are we wanting to go with a long action, 308 action? Yeah, but you go with a long action, like, or we're talking sim auto, so let's just assume that we're talking you know, ARs, right? Sure. AR-15s, AR-10s. All right. All right, so AR-10 or uh, AR-15? Heavier, more recoil, you know. Some would say temperamental. Heavy, yeah, temperamental, ammo's heavy. You can't carry as much for the same weight. Like, but in most situations, do you really need all that 308? Do you really need it? You know, I... I am partial to 30 cal in some situations. Now, if I was going to use an AR for deer hunting, I probably want to go ahead and have a, a large frame AR, maybe in like a 6.5 Creedmoor would be kind of cool, you mm -hmm. know, or a SCAR in 6.5 Creedmoor. We've discussed this before in other videos, but again, this is a rifle that needs to be universally perfect. 
So I think a short action, because so many cartridges can be put into a short action that are still very viable, like mm -hmm. 6ARC, for instance, mm -hmm. right? You know, Chad did a, a video on a 6 millimeter AR that actually went kind of crazy and got a lot of views. That particular video did very well. And then, of course, we saw the 6ARC come out, which is a Sammy spec version of the for just for All argument's of, sake, yeah. let's just say it's a, a Sammy specification version of the the uh, six millimeter AR. But the six arc, you still get some good range, flat trajectory, good bullet weights, good penetrating power on game. You could probably take out a reasonably so, you know decent sized critter with good shot placement for hunting purposes. Obviously, two legged game six arc is, is going to be a pretty nasty pill compared to you know the lighter weight of the five five six. So I'd say six arc is maybe a nice Goldilocks zone where maybe you're not in a in a long action six five Creed or three oh eight AR that's heavy, mm -hmm. but you're also not limited to the uh, lightweight capabilities like a five five six that might have some limitations mm -hmm. compared to something like a six. Yeah, ammo availability is kind of one of those things. I mean, you know, what's out there now, it's okay. I've shot some of it. Yeah. But um Again, yep. let's just say that ammo is not really a consideration. Yeah. Price, availability. Um, this is just more about, hey, if it could be perfect, what would it be? Well, I think Would about, you say that would be the perfect caliber? It's it's definitely like, it's packing the most, well, the 6AR and the 6ARC, they definitely pack the most potential into the short action AR. As far as, uh, like you mentioned, you know, the heavier bullet weights, flat shooting, high BC projectiles, uh, you know, reasonable capabilities like terminal capabilities at close and long range over like five five six let's just say i mean that's where what we're comparing here um I, I think it is like maximizing the potential of that action but you run into complications okay uh gas system lengths usually need to be a little bit longer you know dwell times need to be tuned a bit you know the the buffer weights and buffer springs need to be tuned for proper operation you know adjustable gas blocks would really need to be used because that uh, after dealing with the 6ar for so long it's very temperamental and it, it requires a very specific setup it's not quite so plug and play like a 556 is but but yeah. assuming yes that it's set up properly yes. with the right accessories the right yes. gas block the right widgets yeah. and, and all that happy Sorry. stuff the correct magazines yes uh, it's definitely a viable option. It is. And what about barrel length? Right? What would be the perfect barrel length for a every man, every day? What's the perfect barrel length that is maneuverable yet still offers the terminal ballistics? God's length, 18 inches. 18-inch barrel? Yeah. Now, is that too heavy to maneuver? What's the weight of an 18-inch 6 arc compared to a 16-inch 308? Well, if you're talking about like a government profile or like a medium profile barrel, it's got a bigger hole in it, so it's lightweight. Than a five five six barrel, yeah. technically, right? Okay, but suppressor, suppressor, maybe integral mm. suppress to keep no. the weight or uh, the keep the length down. You're not concerned about the long length for no, maneuverability. Just put a little tiny K can on there, just knock the edge off. Not a big deal. Okay, and like you know, low volume fire, titanium. Yeah, got gotcha. you. Easy. All right. What kind of optic? Mm, after playing with the Oof. new ooh man all right so that's hard so i don't know if you can really consider them low power variable optics anymore but you've got all the one to eights one to tens two to tens you know loophole just released the uh, the new two to ten mark five hd which i do have a sample to play with and it's very nice it's legit very nice so something with close range capability being able to dial it up to shoot at medium to extended ranges with reasonable accuracy potential. Yeah. And it's lightweight for its weight, you know, for its size and class. I mean, it's a 35 millimeter optic. Um, something along those lines would be ideal. I mean, uh, you know, we talked about like scout rifles and stuff in previous videos, like a one to four. One to fours are handy, but with a, a few more ounces and a little bit larger size, you can get you know, twice the magnification capacity or capability. Yeah. Leupold's really knocking out of the park with their scope designs. So. You know, I started out on the Mark IV, you know, with the old uh, uh, TMR, you know, tactical milling reticle. Look, great optic, uh, you know, but they've, they've done some really great work with the Mark Vs and the Mark Eight, and, and, you know, look, great optics. 
you know, for an 18 inch gun, I have to agree. I think that Mark V would be a good choice. If we're talking the perfect rifle, we're talking buy a rifle and set it up that way and buy however much ammo you can afford. And then that's your rifle. Like, well, no matter what you got to use it for to shoot coyotes or hogs or deer or deal with a threat against your life. I mean, what rifle could you grab and know it's going to have your back? I mean, heck yeah. An 18 inch uh, six arc with that uh, M5 on there would be uh, quite the rig. Uh, you're talking about the front end though. So let's talk about the back end. All right. Stock. Well, I mean, on an 18-inch gun, I would probably be partial to an A2 stock. That's just me, but I'm old school. Okay. I'm old school, like so, just a Magpul Mo rifle stock or something, or yeah. a BCM, and, you know, I'm So, good. the problem with those odd cartridges, like the 6 Arc, is that, you know, carbine stocks would work, but really, you know, they'll have a rifle link system, so you really need something like a full-length rifle stock, or like Viltor A5. Yeah. Right. So you still get the reliability and the soft shooting characteristics of, you know, like an A2 length full size buffer, full size rifle spring, but you're condensed a little bit and you do have a little bit of adjustability. So you're taking a little bit of length and adding it to the front with the longer barrel, but you can take a little bit off the rear. I'd be very curious to see how like a 14.5 in that six arc would shoot like if it would still be accurate and still have some decent velocity i'd be willing to have a little bit of a robbing of performance to have a little bit shorter packages easier maneuver in a tight environment but then having the rifle length stock does limit you a bit now i have a lot of rifles set up with the full length a2 stock and i don't mind it it doesn't bother me at all you know but i know that some folks might want something more compact so that might be a limiting factor so i suppose just from a general perspective of what is the perfect rifle? We can discuss features. I mean, I think that the perfect rifle should have a folding stock. Now, that's one difficulty with the AR. Now, you have things like the Law Folder and the Sylvan Arms folders. And I know uh, Stern Defense makes some really cool um, stock mechanisms, like their rapidly uh, you know, detachable stock and their folding mechs and things like that. So it's not like you can't fold an AR. But there's something about it just, I don't know. I I like how an FAL is set up with the paratrooper stock. Mm -hmm. I like the scar with the folding stock. So that's one area that the AR system kind of loses some points. I do like the folding stock. I feel like the perfect rifle should have a folding stock. Uh, that's just me. I mean, to a certain I'm degree. I'm partial to them, but that's so just me. We're talking about like, we're talking about an AR style, you know, upper, lower, right? So you're kind of a traditionalist with a two stock. Well, I'm kind of a traditionalist with the entire setup. Sure. You know, yeah, I, why have a, a, like, a folding stock if the original gun didn't? Yeah. I mean the FAL yeah, folder. Okay. A case mm -hmm. under folders, side folders. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because they don't have a buffer system, but why, why try to take, you know, the, the classic and dependable, reliable, and, you know, let's just say uh, proven design, of the AR sure. and the, the system that operates on and start adding all these who's is who's it's and what's it's to sure. it and adding components that, you know, you're adding stuff to the, to, to the pile that could fail, you know, more parts, more things to lose. Mm -hmm. There's a new bolt carrier group out that I saw that's like basically cut in half. Uh, I don't remember who makes it, but it's got a dual recoil rod system in it. And it, it basically gives you the ability to put a plug on the end of the receiver and then just put a folding mech on it, and you don't have a buffer and uh, spring system. But I've seen some not so good things, you know. And we, about we always, reliability. Yeah, we always joke about Tim breaking everything. Military Arms Channel. But yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's <laughs> he's been having some issues with it. And I haven't had a chance to try one, so I can't really say anything. But you know, it's like you're you're really trying to reinvent the wheel. You start you adding know? crap that wasn't originally in the design, it starts to throw a wrench in. Or the, taking in the things away. I mean, the the buffers or the uh, the uh, the carrier is a very specific weight, you know, and the buffer is a specific weight. The spring is a specific tension, you know, all to make that system operate harmoniously. Sure. And you start taking weight off, adding tiny springs, and it's like, uh, so not so perfect. Not so DI perfect. or piston. Oh, man. I know that's a 
look, we don't <clears throat> have to jump <throat> completely down that rabbit <clears throat> hole, but we're trying to kind uh, of break down features. Like, w- uh, would it be a piston gun or a DI gun? Uh, well, Eric, uh, the piston operation of the AR-15 is technically, or the, the DI operation is technically a piston operation. It's a operation. hybrid piston, yeah, It yeah, is technically yeah. a piston operation. Uh, yeah. You're talking about the top component. So, for ease of use, DI. DI. I but, agree. You know, for and they're cheaper. They are so for for less weight, di um, reliability. Both systems are uber reliable. Uh, you do have more components in pistons usually, so you do have some added weight. You could probably um, run a piston dirty a lot longer. You can, the especially action, if you're running suppressed. Yeah, that's the, gonna add the some. action will definitely stay a lot cleaner. Um, also, in my experience, uh, yeah, you know, just doing suppressor metering over the last several years, pistons are quieter at the ear. Uh, especially on ARs in most cases. There are some guns that have obscene piston pop and they are just crazy loud. Like Scar, like, you know, scar AUG, you know. But um, ARs with a properly tuned piston are very, very quiet at the ear and there's a substantial and noticeable difference at on the ad ear measurements. Um, so for you suppressor guys out there. But um, for, for simplicity's sake of, you know, what the perfect rifle would be, you know, my, my idea of a perfect rifle is like as minimal, the minimal amount of parts as possible to have to, sure. um, you know, have on hand uh, for repair reasons and preventive maintenance, that sort of mm-hmm. thing. One thing I do like about the A2 stock as well, uh, especially in the Mo, you know, big shout out to Magpul. I do like how generous the accessory um, area is in the back of the stock. Um, generally what I do on mine now, some people put a cleaning kit. That's all good and fine. You could, you could. That's what it's for. It's for a cleaning kit. But I like to keep spare parts. I keep some extra, you know, gas rings uh, in there. I keep an extra uh, bolt cam uh, pin, you know, just in case one shears. I keep an extra bolt <laughs> in there, the actual bolt section. I keep a spare extractor, a spare firing pin. I like to carry extra parts. And I'll just stuff a toothbrush in there. Mm-hmm. Nothing crazy. Maybe a dental pick. And that's about all you can really cram in there. You put your toothpaste in there, too? Uh, No. Oh, Definitely okay. not. Oh, oh, that brush is not for your. T- no, oh. that's brush for the gun, Chad. <laughs> but uh, sorry. You know, I do like the Otis pull through clean kits. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the ones that come in the little wraps, like you, you, if you were deployed in the last twenty years, all these wars we were in, you know, the Otis had military contracts. I know you got your you issued your little round cleaning kit that you can just hang on your gear. I like the pull through ones because they're simple, and I just strap it to my gear or to my pack. And if I need to clean my gun, you know, I've got it available, but I, I don't keep the cleaning materials on the gun itself. I like to keep spare parts. Uh, I feel like my the need that I'm going to have for maybe a spare part here or there will probably outweigh my need to have the cleaning kit in the rifle itself. So mm-hmm. just something to consider. Uh, I think the perfect rifle should have maybe some storage on the rifle itself so where you can have a few, you know, maybe even a small vial of oil just in case you get caught without some oil. Mm-hmm which we're about to make a whole gun gripe about running guns dry. So I'm not going to get into that in this particular gun gripe. That'll be the next gun gripe. But um, I think people overlook simple things like spare parts. You know, They do. All right. So that's an important point of contention. Mm. The perfect rifle, sling or no sling? Oh, a sling. Well, duh. You have to have a sling. Duh. The perfect rifle is not the perfect rifle if you don't have a sling on it. That's the easy one. You got to have a sling. All right. Um, what else are we missing? I mean, and look, there's so many different sling options. We're, we're not going to sit there and recommend a certain sling, but if you don't have a way to, you know, take control of your rifle, what if you have to climb a fence? What if you have to overcome an obstacle? What if you need both your hands for something? Maybe you've got to carry someone who's wounded, or for whatever reason, you need to use both your hands. You can't always have to carry around your rifle. You got to have a way to support your rifle on your person you know for a wide variety of different purposes so a sling is absolutely critical Mm -hmm. uh for a fighting rifle or just the perfect rifle also sling attachment points that's uh, a big point on a perfect rifle for me i like to have uh like qd swivels up front but i like to just tie the sling into the stock in the rear i don't like to have a qd swivel in the rear it moves around too much moves around too much and a lot of times the like especially on the Mo's, the inserts they don't have um, rotation stops on them. It's just cylindrical, so the thing will just spin around and twist. Yeah, and it really messes with my OCD. Sure, and I don't like that, so I just tie it into the stock. Even on collapsible stocks, I tie the the sling in. But up front, I like to have a sling point, 
uh, right ahead of the barrel nut for you know just dropping the gun on your chest and having the muzzle pointed down. I like to have one up front too for shoulder carry. Or if you're trying to like offhand a long range shot or something, you can put that sling up front, tie your arm in, and get a little bit more support. A big shout out to Chad at Flatline Fiber Pro. Uh, if you check him out, he's got some awesome slings. We run a lot of the Flatline stuff. And uh, he also makes the wraps that we use on a lot of our ear pro. Uh, one of the ear pro wraps that he makes has this uh, really nice uh, kind of like little HK style uh, MP5 sort of clip that you can clip it on your gear. Really good stuff. It's also got a Velcro name tag for your uh, ear pro. So check them out. Uh, just a quick shout out for Chad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, good good guys over there. Um, and uh, also, was it Neo Mag that makes those mm -hmm. uh, magnetic sling wraps? Mm -hmm. I think those are super important. Like, if you're going to stage your gun, for instance, in your vehicle, all right, you don't want to have the sling just hanging around where it can get caught on something. If you do have to grab it in a hurry, you don't want the sling getting caught on something, and, and now you're screwed, right? Uh, these Neo uh, Neo Mag uh, magnetic wraps, you take your sling and you kind of wrap it up, double it over, and you magnetically, it's got a, a neodymium magnet, and it just holds the sling in place flat against the gun. If you need to deploy the sling, you just grab it, pop it, and the magnet pops loose, and now your sling is loose. Yeah. It's also convenient for storing your, you know, lots of your rifles in your gun safe. If you want to have your slings on there, it keeps the slings from getting all wrapped up on all the other guns in the safe. So it's a good way to keep the slings managed so that you can stack those guns in nice and tight and keep mm -hmm. them in your safe where they're secure and not have them all getting caught all over each other and stuff. So that's important to consider. If, that's like, what, a $20 accessory? Yeah, they're not they're very not bad, expensive. Right? Um, and, you know, and they're just Velcro. Too, yeah. so you know you velcro it on and then it's got magnets to hold your sling in yep. place it's a pretty ingenious design i wish i would have come up with it um <laughs> but like you you know you're talking about ear pro wraps with the hk hook on them you know if you would keep those clipped on your belt you'd remember them more times when we went to the range yeah for real film um <laughs> so all right sling i mean absolute necessity all right so illumination a light illumination i'm glad you thought about that yeah. you got to be able to identify your potential target. I mean... Well, that's if you're going out at night, you know. I mean... Yeah. I mean, I think a flashlight's a super important thing. Or now, I'm going to sit here and say that on an 18-inch gun, you know, now you're, you're getting into the territory where you're beginning to add some heft by putting a light on an 18-inch gun. Especially, you're already hanging a can off the end. So, at that point, does the gun become a little more cumbersome, less perfect? Uh, again, I'll go back to that barrel length. Now... Would six arc be, um, you know, would it would it be practical in a fourteen and a half or twelve inch or you know like a shorter barrel length like you're, that? You're look, I'll, I'll okay, I'll amend, I'll amend my barrel length yeah. to better accommodate your needs. Right. So I'm I'm not I'm not saying that an eighteen inch isn't good because velocity is great mm. and uh, especially in that six arc if you're trying to wring the maximum amount of velocity out of that rig out of a short action then certainly having the longer barrel length is a way to, to accomplish that. In shorter barrels. But my worry, you know, if we had a shorter barrel, maybe a collapsible stock, you can get it a little more compact, perhaps some form of folding mechanism or an action that has a folding mechanism. Like what if you had a, a short action scar in six arc with the folding stock and like a little 12 inch barrel, like, now you're talking. And that, that's more my speed. Like mm -hmm. I like compact, you know. Tiny, tiny. I mean, like most altercations occur at closer range, do they not? Yes, yeah. So it's like in my mind. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to be able to send a six arc pill five six hundred yards, but I don't know. It seems like in a perfect world, you know, I I want to I want to be fast and and have the ability to maneuver at closer range. But hmm. that maybe you know, it's just a difference in I suppose opinion. But I think the perfect rifle should be something that is that can be compact. But also still have a, a little, you know, ability to reach out there a bit. Look, I love, uh, I love the Daniel Defense Mark 18. You know, the 10-3. Uh, you know, hey, it's a li little <laughs> lightweight medicine for longer range. But uh, boy, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a close close in match, you know, that's a that's a nice handy little rig that that can certainly, you know, fulfill a, a wide variety of different situations. But I would be curious to see how a six arc performs in a, in a shorter package, like a 14 inch barrel folding stock, like mm -hmm. an action that could accommodate something more like an FAL. 
like maybe the uh, the Robinsons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the XCRs. Yes, mm-hmm. those are cool. Mm-hmm. The XCR, you know, maybe an XCR and six arc with a shorter barrel and that folding stock mechanism. Mm-hmm. It's got more of an FAL style action, adjustable gas system. Mm-hmm. See, now you're kind of getting. I mean, I love the FAL. I love the SCAR. So you're getting into something that sort of marries some different components, you know? Well, then you're just getting into, well, if you're getting into Robinson, you're getting into something that marries like all of the top guns into one, you know, package. Yeah. More or less. I did. And that that gun did compete with the SCAR for that program. Now, as I recall our range video that we did on it, that the thing shot great. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, it... It exceeded all of our expectations. I don't understand why the scar was picked over it because I think it's a superior rifle, but I think it is too. I don't know. I may have to amend my previous thoughts of an AR. Ooh man, I mean XAR. that Robinson is a pretty sweet setup. He does them in pistols and SBRs. Mm-hmm. It's just interesting. Like when you're exposed to so many different gun designs, you 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 start to see little things about all of them that you mm-hmm. like, and then you also identify some things you don't like, right? Like you know, the AK is cool. I do like it, but it has its inherent inherent accuracy issues, right? You know, the barrel flexes a lot. That's a common complaint. They string a lot. The handguard design, you know, the, the way that the that the furniture is hung on the gun, all the pins and stuff they have to put in there, it, it, it just doesn't really help with the accuracy, right? Especially as the guns heat up, they start to whip around a bit, and it's just a known problem, right? Plus, the intermediate cartridge, there's so many little things that you can point to. Now, like, in its day, was the AK a very useful setup? Of course it was. Mm-hmm. Is that to say the AKs aren't useful now? Of course they're useful. They're still in use everywhere. Again, it's a time-honored argument that we're not going to get into in this particular video. But the point is, when we learn more about guns and we shoot a variety of different rifles over the years, you kind of learn, like, what you like and what you don't. And I always go back to, like, the SCAR. Mm-hmm. There's things I don't like about the SCAR. I'm man enough to say that's my gun. I can say what I want about it. There's things I don't like about the SCAR. But holistically, from a grab-and-go perspective, would I trust my life to my 17? <laughs> oh, buddy, you better believe it. No, that I've, thing is a jackhammer, and it is accurate. The one thing I've never seen is, I'm sure there's probably one out there, but I've never seen like a mud test or you know, uh, uh, environmental test on a uh, Scar or like a Robinson, you know, or anything like that. But I know like the most popular AR test and AK test, you know, uh, in range, you know, Ian and them over there did one. And like that the, Joker's crazy, ain't he? He is. <laughs> they're, they're out of their minds. But like the AR is a closed system and the test proved the legitimacy and the effectiveness of that system because it still ran. Yeah, the you AK know, ate its lunch. Yeah, FAL and 14s, they all do the same thing. They're, they're not a closed system. You can't close that port cover you don't have tight tolerances between the bolt carrier and the upper receiver, yeah. you know, to be able to keep all that crud out of there. Mm-hmm. And the DI system, all that gas comes back into that bolt carrier and blows that crap out of there as the original intention of the design. It keeps it clean. It's like self cleaning, right? And so, self lubricating, but we won't get there. <laughs> I, I mean, like, yeah, some people would say it's a little bit antiquated these days, but. It if it ain't stood, broke, don't fix it, it right? It if it works, it works. Yes. That's right. So You know, it's, it's just interesting. I mean, is that to say that if my life depended on it, that the scar couldn't in some way fail me? I'm sure it could. Anything can fail. Mm-hmm. I mean, nothing is perfect. So it's just an interesting discussion. You know, we, could, we could go all day, but I'll tell you all what. Right. Let me pull... Um, has Twitter been festering long enough? It has been festering. All right, oh, we're yeah. going <laughs> to... I love that word, fester. <laughs> oh! All right, so, all right, I, we're gonna we're gonna go to some of your uh, your your builds on Twitter here. So I asked, what would be your idea of the most perfect rifle, such as features, accessories, caliber, action, etc. Of course, what we just discussed in our own terms, but I want to know what you have to say. So we're gonna take some of your answers, and I think that we did kind of round that out well, right? Like, you know, I, I knew that we would come to a very similar conclusion. Uh, the only thing we, that I would add before we, we answer the, answer some of these is that, like, if I were going to go with that shorter barrel length, I do like the idea of a of a magnifier and red dot. Mm. You know, for close range stuff, you can just flip the magnifier away and you've got a red dot. I do like how fast mm. red dots point. They're very intuitive. But there's great magnifiers out there that work so well 
granted, is it as useful as an ACOG? I, I tend to, mm-hmm. I tend to kind of like, you know, worship at the school of ACOGs. I, I, I prefer ACOGs. You bolt this freaking thing on, you zero it, mm-hmm. you move on with life. It, no it's batteries. a very rapid aiming system. You can use it easily. You can instantly range. It, the ACOGs have a lot going for them, and I have to say I'm partial to them. They're lightweight. They're compact. Okay, Raw7 says a non-NFA 11.5-inch 5.56 with a 10.5-inch quad rail with stock and vertical grip. Okay. I mean, I, I can't say that's not useful. Colin Horn says something with speed, a 308 or a 65 type. Grindle probably since it's a standard lower. Get a solar powered and tritium optic flashlight, comfy foregrip, and a stock that is your perfect cheek weld. Have a nice crisp and light trigger, something with little take up and creep. Okay. Oh, we didn't even. T- oh, triggers. Triggers. <laughs> oh, yeah. I worship at the school of Geisley. All Geisley, long. yeah, yeah, yeah. Super semi auto, two stage, all day long. Nothing but net. Nothing but net. Yep, I agree. I- I'm a Geisley trigger guy. Standard trigger pins. Standard pins. Standard pins. Look, man, I do like those K&S trigger pin sets. I like them. You know why those little cuts are in those standard pins? They're little retention cuts. You know, the springs right in there, and they keep the pins and the gun. I do yeah. like the K&S pin sets, but from everything I've read, you shouldn't use them with Geisley triggers I or mini drop-in triggers, but you know what? I use them, and I like them. That's because Bill just, you know, he wants you to use his trigger pins. Well, I then use the guys with like, trigger pins. Uh, if you use K&S pins, you avoid the warranty. Bye. That's fine. I, I don't know about that. I doubt it. Don't quote me. Let's see. This guy says a Remington, uh, Mike Siegel says a Remington 700 and 6 millimeter BR is an excellent XLR, or an oh, element no, no. XLR chassis. Chassis. 24-inch barrel with an M24 contour and threaded. Ooh, okay, he likes, so a bolt gun. Ooh, boy, he likes carrying around some weight. Yeah, but oh, yeah. And talk about ending any threat you can that see. Thing, look, that thing would not move. You can track that bullet all the way to the target in a 6BR. Let's see. That's some good the good options the here. Um, the rifle I let's see. Jackie Wolf says, the rifle I have, because my theoretical favorite rifle is not for style, but a working one. Okay. Hey, the tool you have is, is the best tool, right? Mm-hmm. The Dashing Rogue says a 5.56 M4A1 with an ACOG, D-ball, suppressor, and vertical grip. Mm-hmm. I concur. I'm su- I'm assuming it means a Daniel Defense M4A1 that's got the pin and welded 14.5. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could you could pin and weld a suppressor on that. Mm-hmm. That'd keep the length pretty reasonable and okay. still have some decent velocity. Huh. All right, this is interesting. I'm, I'm glad that we saw this one. Mm-hmm. Skeptical American says, an AUG and 6.5 Grendel with a decent trigger job. I get all the advantage of a short rifle, but with the full-length barrel. It's light enough to be defensive rifle, but with the Barnes 127 grain LRX, I can use it for hogs and deer with consistent expansion to as low as 1,600 feet per second. Okay. Mm-hmm. 6.5 Grendel. I was thinking more of a 6 arc, but 6.5 Grendel works too. And uh, that Barnes 127, I'm sure that's a, one heck of a bullet. Uh, Rob Warnock says an M16A2 with an M204. Okay, a well, 203. <laughs> All right. 7 PRC and an AR10 action. That was Big K, Big Q Yoda says that. Oh my gosh. Okay, correct you are. <laughs> All right, Private Citizen says an AK47 platform chambered in 300 blackout. Okay. I can dig it. Daniel says a select fire 300 blackout. 8-ish inch SBR with a Surefire EOTech and a silencer uh, that can probably go as far as I need it to. If not, I will play shoots and ladders until a loot drop suffices. (laughs) (laughs) Well, (laughs) yeah. I mean, you know, it is what it is. All right. This is interesting. I I was hoping we would get a comment like this. Johan Dutoit. Johan Dutois. Dutois. He says, a modernized FAL with a quad rail for mounting optics, lasers, uh, etc., and incorporating polymer furniture like the DSA 50, uh, SA-58, for example. I agree. In fact, I think the perfect DSA rifle in the FAL, so they do a couple of different pistol versions, but in the pistol versions, I think they have like an 8-inch barrel and a 10.5-inch barrel, but they make an SBR version with, a, I think, a 12.5-inch barrel, but they don't offer the pistol with a 12.5-inch barrel. My perfect FAL would be the para, 
uh, like the para style folding, like paratrooper stock, but with the 12 and a half inch barrel and a slick side quad rail, maybe an M lock quad rail with M lock accessories. So you can just put the accessories where you want. And then of course a modern optic mount and a barrel that's threaded, maybe five eighths by 24. So you can put all of your average, you know, 308 bore, uh, muzzle devices on there. I think that would be about the perfect FAL. In fact, I messaged DSA about building me one and I was going to convert it into a machine gun and, and play with it on the channel. I never heard back, but I'll reach back out to DSA and see if we could get an SBR 12 and a half and maybe we might convert it or at least do a video on it. I think that would be a pretty epic FAL. I, I, I like the idea of a 12 and a half inch FAL for sure. All right. Um, MT said probably a shorter barrel, 16 inches or less, 762 AR platform. An LPVO red dot uh, um, LR, light IR, 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 light sorry, LR light laser. IR, I'm sorry. IR light and laser. Though I haven't purchased Nodge yet, it is coming in the future. Mm -hmm. That's a great uh, point of consideration. We didn't consider night vision and, and other accessories. I mean, the nice thing about your 18-inch gun idea is that with a thermal clip-on, you could totally engage long-range targets at night mm -hmm. or during the day, and that could really make it a truly versatile mm -hmm. tool with an 18-inch barrel. Whereby my rig that I talked about with the magnifier and red dot, not really set up to run with a clip on in the most traditional sense. That would be more of your D ball territory when you're running something with a red dot. So two different schools of thought and two different uses and methodologies, but I would say a thermal clip on is probably more universally useful than Nodge and a D ball. Mm -hmm. Would you agree? I think so. Unless you have like the new generation thermal uh, hybrid night vision, which what do they uh, call that stuff? I think they're Fusion. PDS 23s or whatever those things are, like the, the new high speed ones. Mm -hmm. And of course, my dogs are going nuts, but that's okay. This is a family show, and the dogs are part of the family. Let's see. There's a lot of comments here. I can't read them all, but I'm going to try to just. Oh, here we go. All right. All right. This makes me feel validated. Here okay. We go. Mick said that I would go with a Robinson XCRM and 300 RCM, 22 inch barrel, Harris bipod, and Night Force scope. Wow. What is, what is what? What is look that up. 300 RCM. What is that? Oh boy, I'm way way behind the curve. RCM. 300 RCM. Ruger, oh, Ruger Compact Magnum. Oh. Uh, well, okay. Well, Ooh. look, if ammo wasn't a, wasn't a, a, a an issue, then that most certainly could be an option. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that we that we did eventually talk about the XCR mm. as being such a a, a, a well thought out platform. <laughs> We need to do more videos on that. Short rifle. action rifle cartridge, uh, medium to large game, okay. uh, designed to closely duplicate the performance of the historic 300 Winchester Magnum cartridge. It's the length of a 308. All right, Bubba Fett. Oh, boy. Uh, another Star Wars reference. He said, I envision some sort of Mark 12 clone, but with the piston operating system for reliability and keeping the bolt and chamber area cleaner. And for whatever reason, I've always been fond of the 6.8 spec round. But another in-between round, like a Grendel or 6-Arc, mm -hmm. would be good as well. So we that's good that we agreed on that. We did forget about the 6-8 spec. Mm -hmm. uh, look, that's a great cartridge as well. Uh, so, great points. All right. Um, this guy said that, uh, Adrian says, if the X95 could drop a pound or two mm. and had an adjustable gas block. Oh, I didn't think about it. Bull pups. Wait. Well, not only bull pups, but weight so perfect Wait. rifle has to weigh what i think it i think 10 pounds fully equipped is the limit okay 10 which, pounds or less which you can do now an 18 inch gun with a little short can flashlight you know bipod that's gonna get heavy quick think but with that m5 though you're trimming what eight or ten ounces so, off the average yeah, scope so those uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of trijicons there's a lot of loopholes and you know lightweight optics that are you know like all right for example a one to four uh like AccuPoint um yeah AccuPoint the the original uh, like one to four trijicons with the um fiber optic illumination and the tritium vial in them they're like 14 ounces or something ridiculous without a mount but pair it with a nice lightweight mount you, you can keep a normal AR, which is around like the seven pound mark or six and a half, seven pounds. You can mm. keep it under 10 pounds fully equipped. For sure. All right. Matt A says a folding stock, piston system, and 6.8 spec. 
I wish the cartridge got more popular like the 300 Blackout, but that would be my choice if I had to, if I could have the ammo too. Okay. Another vote for 6.8 mm -hmm. spec. Uh, you know, maybe we need to build out a 6.8 to do some videos on. Mm -hmm. It's also worth noting that uh, Ruger makes their Mini 30 in 6.8 as well. I don't know how common they are anymore, but I did, did remember seeing some 6.8s. That's a whole other topic, a whole other bag of apples that we are not going to open in today's video. But we do have a Mini 30 video coming up for the 7.62x39 version that I hope you'll tune into. A very special video, but I digress. Steven says, if 6.5 Grendel had the price and availability of 5.56, an AR-15 in that caliber with an uh, LPVO 1 to 10 would be hard to beat. I agree. Boom. I like 6.5 Grendel. I like it quite a bit. I built Brandy a real lightweight 6.5 Grendel. She loves it. We don't shoot it that much, but I probably need to spend some more time behind it. Let's see. <laughs> this Jack, the happy-go-lucky autist, says a default build AKM. That is all. Like, and he just shows a regular <laughs> AK with wooden furniture. Hey, simplicity. Hey, if that's what you want, by all means. There you go. Bouncy Jack. Bouncy Jack says, I'd say the SCAR 17 with a Night Force 1-8 to eight optic Dead air suppressor mount because shooting with a can is just plain old uncivilized. Or shooting without a can is just plain old uncivilized. Caliber 308. Okay. Look, I love my SCAR 17. I will say they suppress okay. They do have a lot of pop. They are kind of noisy. But my, in fact, I have a dead air mount on my on my SCAR. And that's what I run on. On, on my SCAR is a dead air suppressor. And uh, it works quite well. Let's see. There's a lot of options, but we're not going to get crazy here. Uh, a 10-pound parrot rifle. A 10-pound. Yeah, this person said a 10-pounder parrot rifle. Okay, cool. Microwavable <laughs> hot dog. All right. Right on. Let's see. Dan B. says a 7.62x39 side-fed short stroke select fire traditional hunting stock shape forward rail for a scout, uh, scout scope and integrated bipod built-in iron sights with a 16-inch barrel. That's a pretty specific build. Uh, look, 762 by 39 is fine for a close-in uh, situation. And I love shooting hogs with 762 by 39 uh, Back before, you know, we had all the, the trade restrictions with Russia, so we can't really get a lot of things from Russia anymore because of all the sanctions. But uh, we used to get the 154-grain Wolf soft point ammunition in the 762 by 39 And I tell you, it just... It shoots so good, and it's got a nice low tone out of a suppressor, and it slams those hogs, and it just does such a great job on hogs and deer. I've shot deer with that low, too, and it works so good. All right, another vote for the Scar Heavy uh, from Lamory Blue Bryant. All right, there's a lot of comments. I can't go through them all. Uh, Tyler Kamick says, an integrally suppressed 458 SOCOM, semi-automatic, mag-fed, Leupold optic with a bipod. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm not a big fan of the capacity, though. You know, you mm. only get about 10 or 12 shots in most mags, and I kind of like having a 30-round mag at least, you know, but that's just me. Any AK-74 says Lannish Strike. 545 that comes with a lifetime supply of spam cans. Yeah, I wish. Let's see. Honey Badger SBR in 4570. Interesting. <laughs> wow. Let's see. All right, based hospi hospitaler says an ultralight 300 blackout AR pistol with a can SB4 12 to 4 to 12 by 44 with a 45 degree reflex two MOA red dot. Okay, um, that works. Let's see. Boy, there's so many options, and uh, what well, we, we've got. Let's see, Osborne Cox has a vote for the Ohio Ordnance H-Car. Okay, cool. I've shot the H-Car. It's a really awesome rifle. Oh, hefty, though. I don't know if I want to have to carry that thing around too far. Uh, it, it's still a bar, okay? I mean, bars are 20 pounds, you know? It's a, it's a heavy gun. But they are awesome. If you need need that kind of firepower, it'll definitely do the trick. Um, gosh, I could spend probably another 30 minutes reading comments, so I'm not going to, you know... You guys get the idea. The general consensus is that most people want a short, handy configuration in a reasonably powerful cartridge. Most people are, are opting for a suppressor. Almost everyone chooses some form of a light. And almost everyone wants some form of ability to uh, see at night a little bit better, be it night vision and a D-ball or a clip-on thermal or something of that nature. So I think it really 
goes to show you the types of configurations that people are, are, are looking for, like what many people consider to be the perfect mm -hmm. rifle. And I think that if we could just strip away all of the things like caliber and action and all, most people want something that is semi-auto, magazine-fed, mm -hmm. suppressed, with a good quality optic with some magnification, and some form of way to illuminate at night, as well as possibly, if, if money allows, be able to see at night uh, with night vision or mm -hmm. uh, thermal capabilities, which we do have some new pulsars on the way that we're going to be doing some videos on for y'all. They record video. They're awesome. And I'm telling you, the, these new pulsars, when you see them, oh, man, they're they're awesome. I can't wait to show you guys. We're going to go down to South Georgia and go go shoot some pigs. And uh, we're going to be testing out some really awesome new rifles that we, we're going to share with you, which I don't want to let the cat out of the bag yet. But let's just say um, we got some new new guns coming along that, nobody's ever seen before that you're definitely going to want to check out. So lots of things on the way. And we'll actually do sort of a little revisit to this video because we've been testing a lot of gear over the years and we think we've got an idea what we think the perfect AR is. And I think you'll see that soon. So stay tuned for that. But uh, what else, Chad? Are we missing anything? I mean, we've, we've, we've covered the bases. I think we've covered everything. But I'm sure somebody will comment down below like, mm -hmm. uh, you forgot... Yeah, something. So, yeah. But I mean, the only thing I would add is maybe like you got to have a way to carry gear, you know, carry your magazines. So, your support equipment, that's not really in the guise of this video. That's something that's probably a whole nother discussion, but hey. you still have to be able to carry your stuff around. You still wear cargo pants? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Put your mags in your cargo pockets. <laughs> yeah, man, you wear car hearts? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> carry a full loadout. I, you know, I've, I've, I have found myself really liking the battle belt idea, you know, more, more than, more than not, you know, and mm -hmm. a lot of times if I travel, I'll grab my battle belt and my rifle and, uh, yeah, I don't have eight mags or anything like that, but the battle belt has my medical supplies, tourniquets, uh, medical shears, as well as two rifle mags, two extra pistol mags, a multi-tool. So you kind of have this sort of, uh, mobile MacGyver setup where, you know, you generally can plug any hole or make mm -hmm. any hole and, and get yourself out of a reasonable, and of course my pistol, I mean, obviously there's a handgun on it, but you can get yourself out of a, a pretty decent little uh, little issue uh, with the mag that's in the gun and then two mags on your hip. That at least gives you a nice, quick option, something to throw on and, and, and get you out of the situation and, and get you get yourself to a, a, a more advantageous situation. So you're missing, I've become a fan of the battle belts. Yeah, you're missing two uh, very essential pieces of gear on that battle belt. What's that? Bubble gum and duct tape. <laughs> Bubble gum and duct tape. Yeah, and clipping my ear pro on there and leaving them on there, having a set. Um, yeah, I guess we could take just a quick minute to talk about ear pro. I mean, like, we've we've messed around with a lot of different ear pro over the years, and, you know, we, we got a lot of those Howard lights sitting around, and, you know, look, I, I, I've i become kind of partial to the Howard lights. I mean, they work. They're I, reasonably uh, priced. Yeah. I mean, I still use them a lot. I've found myself using the auto noise barriers these days. The in How are those working out for you? The first set worked out well until they didn't. You had to send them back under warranty. Yeah. How much do those things cost? Four hundred bucks. Holy crap! Are those the ones that they they you send in the form and they and they fit them mm. to your ears? No, they're they not. Just... They're not the custom ones. Those are like, dude. Some of those are. Like you can have the custom ones yeah, made. They're like a thousand bucks or more. Wow. In That's like buying prescription glasses at yeah. that point. These are, um, they're uh, electronic ear pro. You just pop them in your ears, uh -huh. turn them on. They've got a high setting that amplifies sounds. And then they've got a low setting that is just like wearing no ears at all. They work fantastic. But when they did, work. <laughs> yeah. I had an issue with mine. I sent them back under warranty. They take care of you? Yeah. Got a brand new set. Good. So, I mean, for that kind of money, surely yeah. they're going to make sure people are made whole. Yeah. And to be fair, I mean, look, you're dealing with electronic devices. You know, things happen. Well, I shoot a lot of precision guns and do a lot of like, you know, range testing and stuff. And the Howard lights do get in the way when you're trying to get behind okay. an optic. Yeah. You know, so they're bulky. I've gotten to the point where I like to wear them when I'm hunting because mm. I can hear every little critter walking around. And sometimes that's a bad thing. You're just like, man, that's a beast walking up. It sounds like a cow. You know, and you turn around as a freaking squirrel because, you know, it's amplifying so much of the noise. But 
after a while, you do kind of learn like which sounds you can disregard, and like you kind of learn like, oh, that's definitely a deer. And you look, mm-hmm. sure enough, here they come. So, you know, it, I could go down the rabbit hole on that, but um, it, it's just interesting to discuss a perfect rifle. So, what is a perfect rifle to you? All right, is there something we missed? Let us know down in the comment section below. Leave all of your uh, comments, and we will revisit this one because I think we we have an idea of the perfect rifle. So. We will revisit this one at a later time. So thank you so much for tuning in. Many more videos on the way. We'll catch you soon.